Good morning, fourth grade friends. It is time for another installment of Jed and the Junkyard War. Um, when last we left Jed, he had gotten aboard the ship um, and there was an issue. They kept trying to ask him what metal he was and he didn't understand their question. He was trying to tell them he was from Denver and they would ask which range and he was like, that's, you know, on the fringe of the junkyard stacks, but that's over the Rocky Mountains. He was from Colorado or the United States. And their questions didn't have the exactly right answers, but they were kind of coming close. So the captain finally said, let's take a walk. So the captain turning around, Kaiser, you're with me. Sprocket, take the helm. Kaiser grabbed Jed by the elbow and pulled him toward a square hole in the deck where stairs led to the lower levels. Set my timer so I don't read the day away. Sadly enough. And we'll start on chapter six. Again, I'll share my screen so you can follow along if you would like, or you can just kick back and listen. Chapter six. They entered a door marked Captain. Wood slats, some cherry, some walnut, paneled the walls. A pair of brown bookcases stood in the corner. Three paintings hung between them. The first piece was a moonlit forest, the next an ocean sunrise. The last was a woman in a red dress, dancing in the street under a rainstorm. The captain pointed to a cracked leather sofa. Sit. He rubbed his chin and assessed Jed up and down. Fresh set of jeans, clean face, smooth hands, out in the middle of nowhere by the fringe. What do you think, Kick, um, Kai? Bunch of glitter tails. No ship's been past the fringe. None that I've heard of. Not one scrounger or relic stalker has even seen the tip of a sky stack. Relic stalker? Chet asked. Quiet boy, the captain said, but still. If this boy knows of a tunnel... He glanced at one of the bookshelves. You actually believe those glitter tails? Jed squinted at the bindings of the fantasy books. Black Hawk Down, Tuesdays with Maury, The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank, The Encyclopedia Britannica. Fairy tales. What is this place? Jed asked. What do you mean? The captain asked. All of it. All of this junk. I've never seen anything like it. Where am I? You're between frog and fringe like every other man alive. What are you playing at? Tell us where you're from. From there. Jed pointed at the painting of the woman in the rain. Kaiser scoffed. Oh, please. You're not from some glitter tail sovereignty where water falls from the sky. You mean rain? Are you saying it doesn't rain here? Captain Bog looked at his bookshelf. I've read about rain. He's a liar, Kaiser shouted. It's all scrap stories. How could anyone live where water fell on top of them all the time? The town motors would be dead in a week. Why would a town need motors? Oh, I see. You must use glitter wings to make your township stay in the sky, yes? The sky? Denver's not in the sky, why would it be? Maybe so it isn't obliterated during a junk storm? Oh wait, let me guess. Denver is so special that junk just falls from the sky all around it, but never above it. Junk doesn't fall from the sky anywhere, ever. Kaiser made another dismissive noise. <laughs> if it doesn't rain here, where do you get your water? Jed asked. Township pumps, where else? Kaiser said. Where do the pumps get it? How am I supposed to know? I'm not a pump engineer. Besides, if water fell from the sky, how would your ships stay dry? We don't have ships because there's no junk. No junk? Not like this, at least. Not all over the ground. Nobody uses junk. We bury it. Now you do have junk, but you bury it? Your lies aren't adding up. Where do you get food if you don't use junk? The captain asked. Where do, what do you live in? Where do you find clothes? We make them? Out of what? Don't you have any trees? Jed asked. Kaiser and the captain looked at each other with blank stares. We find things called trees and cut them up, then make them into other things. I guess it's kind of like the junk here because trees are everywhere. Jed pointed to the painting of the moonlit forest. 
They grow big and then we cut them apart and we make things out of them. Grow? Kaiser's voice was dark and accusing. Yeah, they're alive. Kaiser's eyes narrowed. The look made Jed's skin itch. They're made out of wood and grow and make things like food. And when they get big enough, we cut them apart and make houses. Living junk that you chop up and make into th things? I, uh, I guess, Jed said. Kaiser turned to the captain. Sound familiar? The captain rolled his eyes. That's ridiculous, Kai. Did you hear what he just said? Look at him. Scrawny thing like that? Dainty skin and pouty eyes? No. What are you talking about? Jed asked. Captain Bog held up a hand. All right, that's enough from both of you. Story hours over. Either Golden Boy has answers and won't give them up, or he doesn't know. Either way, it's a waste of time. But Captain, he's clearly... Leave it alone, Kai. That's an order. He cupped his hands to his mouth. Sprocket, get down here! Footsteps pattered above them, then Sprocket entered the cabin. She gave an exaggerated curtsy. curtsy. You called, great and merciful captain of my life? Take care of Golden Boy until we arrive. Me? Why me? Take him to the nest and feed him a can, or half a can, or whatever's left in the garbage. I don't care, just take him. Sprocket folded her arms. Babysitting? Really? I trained as a copper javelin. I've infiltrated iron prison camps. I could blast a falcon's a falcon pilot's eyelash off his pretty little face. And you want me to spoon feed a six-year-old? Now, he said, that's an order. Sprocket turned to Kaiser. So it's a that's an order day, is it? Kaiser gave her a small shrug, though he didn't stop glaring at Jet. Okay, Sprocket said. Well, come on then, golden boy. Jed tried not to look at Kaiser as he followed Sprocket out the door. The man hated him, and Jed had no idea why. Chapter 7 The mess was an open room with mismatched chairs around a chalkboard tabletop propped up by four barrels. Shelves packed with hundreds of cans lined the back wall. A man in a shirt the color of old dishwater sat in the corner, spooning diced pineapple into his mouth. The shirt was three sizes too small, and the man was ten sizes too big. As Sprocket entered, he scrambled upright. His enormous belly didn't slouch over his belt. Instead, it looked like a stiff beach ball, his arms perpetually lifted from his torso. A sparse patch of hair sprouted from his head like the stem of a carrot. This is Pobble, the ship's bard, Sprocket said. He eats and plays fiddle. Nah. Bobble said, his head dropping and chin smoothing, smoothing into his neck. A knob broke on my fiddle, but Riggs is going to fix it up. This is Pobble, Sparket said again. He eats. I'm Jed. Pobble's face brightened. Nice to meet you. Pobble grabbed Jed's hand and shook. His palm swallowed Jed's. Where do you port from? Pobble asked. I, Sprocket held up her hand. Nope. Don't even get started on that. Let's agree he's from far away, far, far away. Wow, Pobble's eyes glistened like wet ping pong balls. Sounds exotic, but there's neat junk out far, far away. Are those all cans of food? Jed asked, pointing to the shelves. Yep, Pobble puffed out his chest with pride. For the most part, can't say I consider spinach actual food. You hungry? Do you eat everything from cans? Pobble squeaked, of course we don't. Bowls and plates are over there. He pointed to a china cabinet stocked with dishes and silverware just as mismatch as the chairs. No, I mean, does all your food come from cans? Where else would it come from? Jed eyed the cans, but how do you find so many in all that junk? Pobble assumed his pride pose again. We're the best scroungers in the yard. It's not that hard, Sprocket said. Look, a can on the ground. She pretended to see a can at her feet. I think I'm going to pick it up. Yep, real tough. Pobble frowned, but then he smiled at Jed. How about some chili? Jed smiled back. Sure. Pobble selected two cans. He pulled a screwdriver from his pocket and began stabbing the can around the rim. What are you doing? He looked up. 
We have to open it, the chili's inside. I know how canned food works, Jed said. Why don't you use this? He dropped the emergency pack and unzipped the pocket with the can opener. What's that? Pavel asked. You've never seen a can opener? How is that possible? You said everything eat comes from cans. Jed took the can and wedged the can opener around its rim. As he twisted the handle, Pavel's ping pong ball eyes returned in full force. Jed popped off the lid and handed the can back to Pavel. Can I try? Pavel asked. Jed showed him how to fit it on the second can. Pavel twisted until the lid popped free, then handed the chili to Jed. Thanks, Jed said. Pavel spooned a bite into his mouth. Do you have a microwave or stove or something? Jed asked. A what? Bits of chili garbled Pavel's words. To heat it up. You don't heat it up? Heat what up? The food? Pavel and Sprocket both looked at the chili. Why would I heat up food? Pavel asked. So it's warm, Jed said. Pavel studied the can. Never mind, Jed said. He found a spoon and took a bite of his cold chili. So what metal are you? Pavel asked. Sprocket snickered. He says he's gold. Ha! Pavel bellowed. Good one, good one. Yeah, me too. I'm gold too. Why does everyone keep asking me what metal I am? Jed asked. I don't know what that means. Pavel stopped laughing. Really? How far away are you from? Pretty far, I guess, Jed said. Come on over here. I'll show you. Jed tailed, Pobble, Jed tailed Pobble to the left side of the room, where a floor-to-ceiling map covered the wall. In truth, it looked more like a treasure map than a map map. At the right edge, there was a solid black vertical strip. At the left edge, there was a solid brown vertical strip. And in the middle, there were large sections shaded in silver, orange, and red. Iron, copper, and rust, Pobble said, pointing to the splotches of color. What metal are you all? Rust, Pavel said excitedly. But rust isn't really a metal, is it? That's the point, Sprocket said. We don't belong to anyone. So there's no gold, Jed asked. Not anymore, at least. Have you never heard the story of gold? Jed shook his head. Well, pull up a seat. Pavel pulled out chairs and they sat around the table. Sprocket took out her shatter lance and an oily rag. Might as well do something useful. Our bard has a habit of droning on and on and once upon a storm, Pavel said, his arms wide and his eyes filled with excitement, there was a man more golden than the sun. He lived hundreds of years ago, maybe even thousands. Nobody knows for sure. Sprocket smirked. It's sort of a big difference, don't you think? How about you let me tell the story, Pavel said. He began again thousands of years ago before the yard had junk, before towns flew in the sky, before, are we almost at the end? Sprocket asked. Don't listen to her, Pavel said to Jed. She has the attention of a duck slug, one without very good attention. Thousands of years ago, all the towns were built right on the ground, golden cities, with cans of food bigger than this tug, and batteries too, more batteries than a whole town of men could carry. Sprocket blew on her shadow lance's barrel. What about a town of women? Pobble rolled his eyes, still too many. What were they using to carry the batteries? Sprocket asked. Did everyone have bags or did they just use their hands? There were just lots of batteries, okay, Pobble said. Sprocket winked at Pobble. The people who lived there were as gold as the town itself. So where'd they get all those batteries? Sprocket asked. They probably had giant junk makers or something. I don't know. Sprocket nodded. Oh. That makes perfect sense. Sorry for interrupting. Pavel ignored her. One day, a disease spread through the town, the blotch. Everyone started getting sick, coughing and stumbling. Doctors tried patches and medicine, but nothing worked. It was as if the gold itself was diseased. Folks got sicker until they were so sick, their bodies stopped working right. Arms, legs, fingers, toes, all just wilted and died, like they were dead stumps clinging to nearly dead townsfolk. The dead limbs rotted so badly they started falling right off, flapped straight to the ground, deader than a slug stuck to the bottom of a boot. Townsfolk limped around the streets, some with barely half an arm to drag their own body along. They grew so desperate they pulled apart machines and sewed scrap parts right to their elbows and knees. 
but the disease didn't stop. It rotted away gold until there wasn't gold left to rot. The townspeople replaced so many parts, they became empty. No souls, just empty inside. And they still crawl the yard today, flying about in broken ships, making everyone who sees them feel as empty as them, sounding more like clanking metal than people, looking so awful that folk now just call them dread. Jed waited for Pavel to continue, but he didn't. He sat back and released a deep, story conclusion style sigh. <sighs> then what happened? Jed asked. Happened with what? The dread. What's the end of the story? Pavel looked from Jed to Sprocket. That was the end. That's the story of where the dread come from. You're saying they're real? Jed asked with a, yeah, right, there's no way I'm believing that, Joan. Pavel laughed once. Of course they're real. What else do you think lives in the fog? He pointed a stubby finger at the wall map. Jed eyed the map's wide black edge. That story can't be true. Those things can't actually exist. The dread, Pavel repeated. You know, the dread. He hooked his arms together and twisted his expression to look like scrambled eggs. The dread, Spocket echoed. Sprocket echoed, as if Jed simply couldn't understand Popple's accent. Yeah, no, I heard that part. Sprocket interjected. Denver? Denver. She stood and motioned for Jed to join her at the map. She pointed to the far left near the orange border. It read the fringe. We picked you up here, she said. Show me where Denver is. I'm from somewhere else, somewhere not on here. Here? Sprocket walked to the other side and touched the black edge of the map. Jed shook his head. Not there either. I don't think so, at least. Brown letters inside the black edge read, The Fog. I'm from somewhere other than the fringe and the fog. I've never been anywhere on this map, and I've never heard of the dread. You're serious, Sprocket said. Completely serious? Completely, Jed said. Do those things, the dread, exist? Let me show you something, Sprocket said, waving Jed to follow, and you can tell me if they exist. Chapter 8. Jed, Sprocket, and Pobble walked to the main deck near the largest mast. Pobble took a can of diced tomatoes with him and ate as they walked. There, Sprocket said. Halfway up the smokestack, a head sat mounted to a metal plate. The face was a patchwork of patchwork of bolts and springs. Gears littered the inside of its skull and left cheek. Frayed cables and wires fused patches of leathery skin with scraps of rusted metal. Where its left eye should have been, there was only a dark hole. Its edges withered and wrinkled. In the place of its right eye sat a brass spyglass with a cracked lens. That thing was a dread? Ted asked. Ooh, look, there's a picture. We finally got one. Before Sprocket could answer, the gears inside the shriveled head ground to life. Sparks dribbled from the frayed wires and the face tilted. Though it had no eyes, Jed knew it was looking straight at him. He could feel it, as if the empty hole wasn't empty at all. Then it spoke. Well, well, what have we here? Jed lurched backward. The gears spun faster and its ashy lips curled into a grin. Here we have Captain Spyglass, Sprocket said, as if she were a museum tour guide. Captain of the smokestack. Pobble chuckled. It's alive, Jed said. I wouldn't say what that thing is counts as alive exactly, Sprocket said. It wriggles around and speaks, if that's what you mean. Of course I'm alive, little boy. Alive but alone. All alone. I do wish I had a friend. Someone to talk to. Someone who would hold me. Someone I could pull apart into little pieces and slurp up for breakfast. Will you be my friend? Jed took another step back. Charming, isn't he? Sprocket said. Come up here and give me a hug, little boy. You can stand on the fat one there. Jump on him like a trampoline. Pavel's lower lip scrunched in embarrassed anger. Oh, don't look so pouty, the dread said to Pavel. It makes you look fat. Then again, being fat also makes you look fat, I suppose. Nice guy, huh? Hey, shut your ugly mouth, Sprocket said. 
She took Pavel's can of tomatoes and chucked it at the dread. The can smacked it square in the face, but the thing didn't even flinch. One of these nights, it said to Sprocket, when you're sleeping safe and sound, I'm going to find you, and then I'm going to slurp up every last bit of soup you keep inside that soft pink bag you call skin. Sure you will, Sprocket said. Only one problem. You're a bit short on legs and arms, and your face is nailed to a smokestack. Oh, and we killed all your buddies, so good luck with that. The dread dragged its tongue around the rim of its lips. You'll be the first to go. I won't roast you or boil you like I do with the rest of this crew. You, I'll have raw. And next I'll eat you, it said, tilting its head toward Pavel, though that might take a while. Remember the whole no legs thing, Sprocket said? Don't worry about me, dear. I'm patient. So when I do get my legs back, because eventually I will, know that I'm coming for you. Come on, Pavel said, let's go. He and Sprocket turned and began walking away. But before Jed could follow, the head looked at him again, its empty black socket boring into him as if the cavity itself was staring at him. It spoke in a voice that was barely a whisper. Happy birthday! Cold shuddered through Jed's arm. What? he whispered and returned. The spyglass protruded another inch, focusing on Jed's eyes. Welcome back! They stared at each other in silence for another moment. You okay? Pavel's voice was right behind him. Jed recoiled. Whoa there, it's just me. You okay? Huh? Oh, I'm fine. Sorry, you, you just startled me. Pavel slapped Jed on the back. I know what you mean. That creeper makes my stomach feel like leftover green beans. Yeah, Jed said, staring back at the dreads now expressionless face. Pavel grinned. You know what always makes that feeling go away? What? Strawberries. I have a secret stash of fruit cans in the mess. How about we share a can later? Save me some peaches and it'll stay a secret stash, Sprocket said. Pavel smirked. Yeah, okay. Also, would you watch Golden Boy while I check on the meat on the nest? How about it, Jed? Pavel asked. Want to take a tour? Jed nodded. For the first time since he'd been on board, someone had used his actual name. I'd love to. Precious, Sprocket said. You two go play. She turned to walk away, but paused and added over her shoulder, don't touch anything. Chapter nine is where we're going to stop for today. So there's a dread or part of a dread attached to the smokestack of the ship doesn't seem to be very nice, but when the others walk away, it knows Jed. It knows that it was his birthday and told him welcome back. Because remember in the letter from his parents, they said they escaped from the junk yard a long time ago when he was little. So he's been there before, although he doesn't remember it. And now that dread is talking to him. So, I'll read another couple chapters in a couple days. Remember, it's always posted on the YouTube channel on the fourth grade playlist, so it'll keep it in order, and you can just join in wherever you left off last. Talk to you later, my friends. Bye.